And I understand Doug's on there. Doug, you haven't called me in a while. I'm sure everything's fine. Is he still on? Is he not on now? Um, and I'm, I'm not sure. I may go one class tonight um, because uh, two days ago I walked Rocky and, uh, boy, the allergies just hit me in my head. I feel like I'm underwater right now, and I, my hearing is all weird and everything, my seeing, everything. But uh, my heart is full of Jesus. And I love you guys, and I'm just glad to be here, and just glad to be alive. <laughs> okay, Philippians chapter 2. Now, some of the things we're going to be sharing, not just in this class, but in the others, is uh, some of it's going to be sort of a repeat, but it's not a repeat. It's, build, it's bringing back to build on something more. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, again, there's so much, so much material that I have that I, I just hate thinking about having to put you through another semester after one before this and now this one. <clears throat> but but uh, so I may try to read a lot, but we know how that goes. You know, well, I usually end up talking more than reading. All right, Philippians 2, and really what we've been discussing uh, specifically, we've been focusing in now on verse uh, 9 and 10 and 11. So let's look there, Philippians 2, 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, so um, <clears throat> my question in reading this is why, you know, and here we go with my questions, but why should, why should every knee bow, and why does every tongue have to confess him as Lord. Um, that, I, you know, now using my weird mind, but I'm thinking, okay, he died on the cross to save us, so he's Savior. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way I think. I'm thinking now, everything was, now this is not true, but this is you know, everything was done so he could save us, which is the general view of most of Christianity, that the whole work of the cross and the whole work of God is simply to save us from hell, which is not the case. Thank you, brother. Oh, good. Look, it's Welch's grape, and I can spill this on my shirt and not get in trouble. <laughs> there is a God, and there, he's using his, his servant, Shay. All right, so I'll read. This must and will take place because the resurrection of Jesus was a resurrection unto lordship. It was a resurrection unto lordship. God did not merely raise him from the dead, <clears throat> but listen carefully, but raised him all the way up unto lordship. Okay, it's easy to understand why God raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, I mean, you can, you can think of that on a lot of different levels. <clears throat> God raised Jesus from the dead because uh, he was innocent and they shouldn't have done that to him, so he raised him up. I mean, you know, uh, God raised Jesus from the dead because, and this is one of the things that we'll get into, uh, which is in Ezekiel 18, verse 20, it says... The soul that sinneth shall die. Or you can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the day that you eat, you shall surely die. And so death is connected with sin. Okay. But Jesus never sinned. 
Bless you. I, what is it? I, whatever you from that sneezing during my class. You absolve me? I absolve you, yeah. I dissolve you from the, <laughs> from the universe. Oh, I mean, <clears throat> good thing that I don't have any power. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, I should say that if anybody ever goes back and transcribes all this, that, it, that, I hope, <laughs> that hopefully I should, you know, other than that part right there, hopefully, you know, things should be organized better. But these sessions, these <laughs> classes are going to be not as organized as I would like them because there's so much that the Lord has shared with me. And it's just been, you know, to get what I've got, I feel good about. Um, but that scripture, the soul that sinned shall die, or in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. Um, Jesus never sinned. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that he has every right to be raised, or God has every right to resurrect him, because he never sinned. And sin and death is really the result of sin. Except in Jesus' case. And he became a sacrifice. And um, let me catch up here. Only those who have sinned are required to die. Also remember that Jesus did indeed die, but not because of personal sin or failure. He died as a sacrifice for others. And keep your place here in Philippians, but you know this, but it's always good to look at it. Over in Hebrews, and Hebrews is a great place to talk about this kind of stuff. Hebrews 9 in verse uh, 26. <clears throat> and that is, yeah, there it is at the very end. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the ages, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. <clears throat> By the sacrifice of himself. That means that the death that he died was for sin, but not for his own. Not for his own. Which gives him every right for resurrection. But that's still not the issue here. That's not the question. But let's finish this out. If this is so, then he must, then then we must conclude that if Jesus did not sin, then God had every right to raise him from death, because he did not deserve to stay dead. Okay, uh, I told you keep your place in Philippians. Don't go back there. <clears throat> I didn't. But luckily, I flipped right to it. But let's go to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 13. Show you just a few things here. <clears throat> okay, we're, we're primarily going to get down in the... 30s, 35, around there, but I want to look at one verse in verse 23, Acts 13, verse 23. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Okay. Notice the wording. <clears throat> the wording here <clears throat> is that Jesus was raised to be a savior. Okay. Now, now, but I don't, again, I don't know how your mind thinks, but my question is, well, I thought he died to be a savior. I mean, you know, I go, well, what do you mean you raised him to be a savior? He died and we're, and think about that. I mean, if he died and he carried all of our sins and stayed dead, he would still be our Savior, right? Come on, think through it. But don't hurt yourself. I smell something burning. <laughs> yes? Romans 4 and 5 doesn't say that. Yeah, okay. Romans 4 and 5 doesn't say that. Right. Right. 
Yeah. Now, I'm not going to get into the full theology of that because I've done that many times in the, in, over the course of the, the years here. But it's interesting wording there, don't you think? But here he is raised as a savior. But now let's drop down so we can see the, the import of uh, the further verses here. Verse 35. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not allow thine holy one to see corruption. Now, a lot of people thought that since David was saying that, that God was talking about David. Because <coughs> David wrote it way back in the Psalms. Okay. And Luke is pointing out that the Bible actually speaks of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, he understood that, and I think most of the, the basic first century church understood that. It's modern-day Christianity is not so aware of that. So he immediately sees this as speaking of Jesus. <clears throat> uh, Thou shalt not allow thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. So he's, he is bringing to bear in this that David, in that sense, was not raised from the dead or was not protected from death. But he whom God raised, again, saw no corruption, meaning he wasn't in the grave long enough to see corruption. All right, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto, unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> All right. So again, the, the resurrection, as pointed out by a lot of these scriptures, is, and let me, let me, let me make a, a demarcation between the resurrection and being raised. God raised Jesus from the dead. That was an act on God's part. He raised him from the dead. But when Jesus came forth in resurrection, he is the resurrection. For us, if, if he rose and we're in him, then he is the resurrection. Okay. So this isn't, these scriptures have not been addressing that reality of him being the resurrection. These scriptures are addressing the reality that God raised him. And that's real important to our scriptures that we're going to get into in Philippians, or have read, and we'll, we'll get into a little more. Because... We really don't see much difference in the word or in our understanding of the act of God raising him from the dead, Jesus as the resurrection, taking it beyond that, raised and ascended and exalted as Lord. That's all different things. It all comes from different places, too. It's not all the result of just one woomy, wham, you know, boom, there it happened, you know, and we just go, Phew, wow, that was cool, you know. There's a difference there, and we'll get into that as we go. Let's finish out this, this part, though. However, our verses in Philippians add something far beyond just raising Jesus back up because he hadn't sinned. Hey, I want you to think about that. I mean, you, we read the scriptures. Philippians is just powerful. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee, heaven and earth, and every tongue. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Well, that's, that's a lot more than you didn't sin. Get up. Amen? 
And we have to think of it. We have to, I mean, we're never really going to be impacted and have our being changed by, by God's reality by just taking theological terms and going, oh, okay, this was this and this was that and praise God. No transformation, just information. Um, so, so that's why we come to class uh, not just to sit and learn, not just to um, take in whatever information that we can glean during that class, but we come with our hearts prepared for the Holy Spirit to lay a, a meal, as it were, on the inside of us, you know? We come hungry, we come uh, needy, we come uh, ignorant, always ignorant, but always, you know, wanting the Lord. When I say always ignorant, he's so big, how could we, he's the length and the breadth and the height and the depth, okay? So we'll always have that ignorance, but that ignorance can be our friend as we it causes us to come in a more humbled state instead of a know-it-all. You know, to, 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 want, to want the Lord and to need the Lord are two different things. To want the Lord, everybody wants the Lord, you know what I mean? I mean, it'd be like the best, most cutest, most glorious dress in the window shop, you know, down there, but it's way too expensive. And all the women could walk and stop and look at it and go, oh, it's so pretty. But, you know, only a few can buy it, you know. Well, this, we all can buy it if we will, if we will buy it, you know. Buy the truth, it tells us. And so, um, and so the scriptures will just uh, be, you know, as I've said many times, ink on white paper. They'll just be... There'll be teachings of a man 2,000 years ago. Well, that, that man lives in us. That life lives in us. And that life is limited by us and our, our ability to release him by knowing him and knowing what this is all about and by being transformed by reality. You know, it says, uh, uh, and he was full of grace and truth. Well, the word truth there isn't that he knew everything. He does know everything. He's God, for God's sake. <laughs> it's he's full of grace and reality. That's the actual Greek word there. It's reality. And, and sadly, most of us who are not really aware of what he has accomplished through the cross and through the resurrection live in this, and we call all of this reality. This is our reality. And it's not, it's not him who is full of God's reality. And so, um, so the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God wants to do more than visit either here or any other church um, and just sort of bless people. He wants to break the bread of life. The bread of life. And the question is, are we hungry? Are we hungry for life? Are we hungry for his life? And if we are, blessed are the hung hungry, sir. So, you know, he'll fill you. Praise God. I mean, we can be assured of that. We don't have to worry and fret. Well, I don't know why he's not. Well, partially you're not going. Well, you know, he said, you know. Blessed are the hungry because they shall be filled, and I'm hungry, so I'm going to be filled. It's, yeah. There's no faith in it at all. There's no looking to him in anticipation of him fulfilling his word as the word. Yes. It's just precious promises. Yes. You know. <clears throat> all right. So... So I'll read this verse again. However, our verses in Philippians add something far beyond just raising Jesus back up because he had not sinned. And that is a glorious truth, but that is a truth in relationship to redemption, 
not to God's eternal plan. The eternal plan, the plan that is most dear to his heart. And I won't go into all of tree of knowledge of good and evil and tree of life and what God had in mind from the very beginning and then we chose this and da 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 you know but once he brings us back through salvation then there's a whole nother door into the holy of holies and that's what it tells us to enter in boldly to and we're still out there you know you know, gutting up lambs and, you know, washing, trying to get clean and worrying over all of, you know, how we doing and all this stuff. We're living in the outer courts. And we're not coming boldly because we don't realize that once he settled that, he's okay, you know. He's okay. Jesus is seated at his right hand. He know, He sat down. And the Father knows he sat down. That means it's a finished work. But that's a finished work. But there's still another work that the Holy Spirit is actively down here trying to bring us into beyond that. Yeah. All right. So the resurrection brought, a, brought about by God was not simply to raise him back up to his original status. Consider Lazarus. And we've talked about that once just a little bit. Lazarus was a man, he was a, a brother to Martha and Mary. He was uh, known in the community. And when he died, there was weeping and mourning, but when he was raised back up, guess what? He went back to the same house, he hugged his sisters, all of the neighbors passed him on the street and said, hey, Lazarus. It's good to see you back. That's, you know, I know Christians that that's pretty much their understanding of Jesus that was raised from the dead. Well, he's back now. They, you know, here's the old saying. I've heard this said, well, you can't keep a good man down. Really? That's it? That's the resurrection? Really? That's it? You just can't, you know, can't keep a good man down, so he just popped back up. You know, it's like, like trying to drown somebody in the river of life. You know what? Just can't keep them down. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, we got all these concepts, all this, you know, people think I'm weird. I think that's weird. <laughs> you know? And, and a lot of this stuff, I just think it's weird because it's, it's out of character with God. Well, if you don't know the character of God, if you don't know his ways, but it's out of character with the way that he is. He's not just randomly, and that's, that's this thing. We give God a lot of leeway because we allow him to just randomly do anything without asking or wanting to know the truth behind it because there doesn't even have to be a truth behind it. He's God, you know, just he can do whatever he wants and let's just shut up, you know. Well, we're not questioning God. We're, we're wanting to know him. We're wanting to know what's... I just think that he likes that when we sort of crawl up in his lap and say, Father, I just don't have a clue. I, you know, I just don't get this. And, and I wish you just begin to sort of open my eyes to some of these things that are in your heart. And never, never say, you know, open, Lord, open my eyes to what Randy's teaching. Whatever I'm teaching is nothing compared to what's in his heart. I've got a, a little, you know, there's this old vast, and I'm just barely, you know, look, I'm just, I think I've got something, you know, I think I'm seeing something here. Don't, don't mess with that. Just go straight to his heart and let him explain, you know, and John said that. He says, you know, if you've received the, the, the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. The witness of God is greater. If you've, if you've borne witness to, you know, 
And the woman at the well, same thing. I mean, she went into town and she started telling everybody about Jesus out there. And then they came out and Jesus started sharing with them. And they, what did they say? They said, well, we initially believed because of what she said, but now we believe because of what you are saying to us. That's better. That's much better. Hallelujah. And that should be the desire of every minister on the planet to initially release something that will cause them to seek the Lord on their own and, and know far beyond anything I would ever know. And yet we all know the same thing, Jesus. <laughs> it's all the same thing. So there's none greater or lesser in that. It's just hunger drives you or you get bored with what you got. Some people do. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> Uh, he was not merely raised from death, but he was exalted to lordship. And guess what? Now, we all know that. So, because we're spirit filled or whatever, we're charismatic or we know stuff, you know. I mean, we know stuff. And, Je and Jesus is Lord, you know what I mean? I mean, you go to any charismatic meeting and the preacher comes out or the worship leader and says, Jesus is Lord. Everybody go, amen. You know, but why is Jesus Lord? Why isn't he just a raised up savior? And not all, not all of the places in the Bible explain that because some of them are talking about salvation and some of them are talking about you know the fact that there was jesus didn't die and different aspects of this thing but philippians philippians is talking about this subject right here and it's trying to open our eyes to something that you won't see in a lot of other places excuse me all right so um I'll read that one again. God was not merely raised from death, but also raised Jesus and exalted him to lordship. God raised him and exalted him. His resurrection had the immediate result of making this selfless one lord of all. Now, you remember, we, we discussed, we went through a little time where we shared that God raised him and or God exalted him based on what is uh, low God what is humbled God raises up and what exalts itself God puts down and then and, and we haven't even fully covered this I guess we'll get into it the next little bit here but it's all based on the degree. Somebody says, well, I humbled myself, and, but you know, I wasn't exalted, but for about like two days. Well, that's because the, the depth of your humbling was like about that much, you know, a pittance, just a centimeter of humility. And you think that ought to open heaven's pearly gates for you, you know, and Jesus will set out a, another throne for you. No. That stuff doesn't last long. I mean, there is a, there's either a life or there's something that we're trying to do to get something. See, Jesus became a sacrifice for others. And because it was totally selfless and pure of selfish motives, com completely clean, God hath highly exalted him. <coughs> Hallelujah. You see? And so this is why we need the Holy Spirit to purify our motives, purify, you know, uh, uh, show us the cross in such a manner that it'll be like what Paul said, not I, but Christ. That when we get ready to move, we, we, we're still here in the sense of we can, you, you know, we still have a soul. You know that? Still have a soul. And your soul can say, well, why don't we go do this? Or your body can say, well, let's just blow this off. You know, I'm tired. Well, guess what? We're all tired. Amen. 
we're all tired. You know, well, I need a break. I mean, I, I remember, I haven't shared this story in a long time, but when I was in Bible school, uh, we had a, in the, in the guy's dorm, we had a little kitchen, and uh, I'd go in there because the rooms didn't have roofs on them. So Just you could, walls. what? Just the walls. Just the walls, but not a roof. I mean, there was a roof over the building, but not over the room so that it went up and all the sound went all over the place. So, so I would go into the kitchen and just sit at a table and try to study. And I remember one, one Saturday morning, I went in there, and then all of a sudden, a bunch of the guys come in. They said, man, let's go. Hey, let's, you know, let's go uh, uh, go to a movie together. Go do this. Or I forget what it was. I don't even remember what it was. It seemed to me like it was going to be go to the beach and have an all-day thing. And I said, no, man, I really, I've really been waiting for the weekend. There's some things that have been on my heart to search, and I, I want to I just... I just want to spend time with Jesus. Please let me stay here. Just go have fun. You know, there's no condemnation on my part. It's just that this was my, this was one of the few opportunities I was going to get for hours to spend with Jesus, and they were all going to be gone. <laughs> Woohoo! You know, and so I said, you know, so. You know, one of them goes, yeah, I see, you're Mr. Spiritual, da-da-da-da. Well, that, that wasn't in my heart at all. I just wanted Jesus. I guess that is spiritual, but it's not what people call spirituality. They're, they're mocking, you know, something like that. And, and they said, you know, come on, man. You know, we need a break. Let's go do all this stuff. And they left, and I was sitting there thinking about it, and I went, you know, I don't really need a break from Jesus. That doesn't sound right to me. I, now I don't. Yeah, and now I'm not. I'm not saying it's not okay to go do whatever. You know, go to the beach. Go, go do all that. I'm not. There's no condemnation for me in that. I'm talking about a thought. Maybe they don't even have it. But I was thinking, oh yeah, you know, we've been in Bible school learning Jesus and doing all this stuff, and we need a break from this. When I'm thinking, all I want to do, you know. Is, is get into the Word and know the Lord. And I tell you what, it paid off for me because I didn't know what was coming. I mean, I, I barely graduated, and I was on the mission field, and I was pastoring how many churches? Three, three churches, uh, the prison ministry and the poor farm, which were all incredibly hard, bad, tough situations. And... Time and time again, while I was there and put in these situations, I was like 23 years old, put in these situations of leadership and of, of carrying everybody else, I thanked God for every ounce I squeezed out of that Bible school or, or church or, you know what I mean, you know what I'm talking about, that the, the time that I got, you know, I redeemed the time. I didn't just go, eh, you know, whatever. And... And it, you know, it saved my life because I was so young. And, you know, you know what the scriptures say about a novice, you know, don't put a, a novice, a new, a young person into a whole bunch of leadership and stuff like that. Man, it would have destroyed me. I believe it would have destroyed me. It was so much. I mean, it was so much. And there on that little island away from all of the cities back in the bush there were no breaks were there dead there were no breaks for years and years i mean it just went on and on and i cannot tell you the amount of times i was just just in gratitude would just overwhelm me to think, oh, I'm so glad at the times that I, I said, you know, I mean, because you, you, can, you can say when you're in that situation, I'm just, you know, well, I'm just young and da-da-da-da and things are going to be easy and probably when I become 50, they'll want me to be a pastor or something. You know what I'm saying. You know, when I get down the road a little bit and you get over there, man, and anybody that can breathe, they need help. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
Anyway, all of that to say, we, we need Jesus. We need to stay full because we never know what's coming. All right. His resurrection had the immediate result of making this selfless one Lord of all. That's how high the exaltation by God goes. Wherefore, you remember me writing that on the board? Wherefore he had highly exalted. That's how high that exaltation went from the, from the hand of God. Why? Well, let me, let's go back. Th that's how high the exaltation by God goes. This was the Father's doing. This was the Father's doing now. Why? God did not do so founded upon some legal basis, meaning he never sinned. I have to raise him from the dead. You, do you understand kind of what I'm saying? It's not a legal document working here. It's not a, tum, 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 you know, let's sign the papers, and yes, this is the way it's done, and it's a contract. This is God functioning by what never changed in him, whether by Old Testament or New Testament. If a king who he exalted started exalting himself, God brought him down. And if some little shepherd boy, like what Ben was sharing on Sunday morning, little shepherd boy out there is serving God with what he has and giving him all he's got under, under you know, what, you know, you, what am I doing out here with the sheep? What am I doing out here babysitting this? I've been in the word, you know, but not David. He's out there. And he's looking at the sheep and he's thinking about how he's, he had to deal with that bear and that lion that came along. And he's thinking about it. And he's just, he can, I can see the sheep in a nice pasture at this moment. And he's just laying there looking at the sheep and they're contented and the little lambs are running around and stuff like that. And he's thinking, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. See, he's not just going, well, God gave me a job and I'll just do it and I'll be faithful and da 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 da. He's seeing God in this thing. He's seeing everything, you know, you've heard it before, be faithful in that which is least. David was. He became king. He humbled himself. He took the least. He didn't just, he didn't just uh, be put as the least and put up with it. He took it. And he became faithful. In it. Well, that's God. That's not a. That's not a contract. That's not a covenant. That's just God on 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 humility or on self exaltation. Just the way He functions. <clears throat> All right. So, so I said, why God did so found not founded upon some legal basis, but simply exalted what He has always exalted the lowly. I mean, you don't have to worry about it. You know, why do we worry and we fret and why, why is this and when, when will this change and da 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 You know, he's not going to exalt you. You're not, you're not lowly. You're just faking it, putting up with it. Inside of you, you're not lowly. You're exalted, and you can't wait to reach your position. Your deserved position. You don't deserve any. You, we deserve death, people. We, we, that's what we deserve. And yet, we somehow, we come out of this going, well, then why doesn't God do this? And why isn't he moving now? And when is he going to do this? And I don't know this. I mean, I've been down. I've been lowly. I've been this and that. And it's time to raise me up. Oh, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. You're going to have to stay down a little longer. You remember, you remember Joseph, don't you? In the, in the prison down there in Egypt. And 
So he's, he's telling this guy this dream, and, and it ends up true, and this one guy's going to be released, and he says, oh, by the way, be sure and tell Pharaoh that I was the one who did this, okay? And he ends up, I forget how long now, seven more years, something like that in prison, you know, because God's, it's the, it's the wine press, folks. It's Gethsemane. That's what Gethsemane means. It's the wine press. He's, he's not being mean to you. It may be mean to Naomi, but not to Ruth. It may be mean to your soul, but not your spirit. But that's because your soul wants whatever it can get. Whatever it can get. It's just the way the soul is. Okay? All right. So, let's see. Where are we at? I, I, I can start this other one. It's a short one, too. This is, uh, the subtitle is Exaltation Based on the Degree of Humiliation, which we've talked about, but let's just see if there's a little more here that we can get from the Lord. As noted before, this selfless one is what God honors among men. However, what we have not yet made plain thus far is that the extent of Jesus' exaltation was founded upon the depth and the degree of his selflessness. It was because of the extent of self-abasement and self-effacement which Jesus endured that God glorified him unto such universal exaltation. Universal exaltation. I mean, universe. Lord of all. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I was, med- and trust me, I was meditating on all this for a good long while, and I was thinking, you know, Lord, I mean, in a sense, now I know that we all know he's Lord of all, but in a sense, we see Jesus doing the right thing for others at the cross, and so God exalts him to lordship, okay, lordship, but Lord of all, universal exaltation, well, that's different. That's different. That's not just doing the right thing and then you're a Lord, but there's a lot of other Lords. There's something about the spirit in which he did all that. In Philippians 2, the first portion of these passages addresses the glorious self-giving of Christ. And when we say the glorious self-giving, that's based on the view of the Father. Because that self-giving was nothing but bad treatment and not being fair to him. This isn't fair and and of, of accused, falsely accusing him and you know, and of, uh, of uh, the, the, what is it, the, the time doesn't fit the crime, meaning what he was, had to endure didn't fit what they were accusing him of. That's the wheels of We can call them justice and everything else, folks. It's the wheels of self-righteousness that is wrestling with issues instead of being, just being, being life. And and how, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to just say this right now. How do I really explain that? I can't explain that. I mean, I really can't. I, I can only tell you that, it, that, um, that while the cross was difficult for Jesus, the scriptures make that clear. I mean, it does, you know. I mean, he's, he said, now is my soul troubled. Okay. So Jesus had soul trouble. Are you, you ever... You ever considered that? Now is my soul trouble. Jesus had soul trouble. But is the next word. But. Because he was a man. He was a human. He was a person. He, he was one of us, as it were. So he had a soul, and he had soul trouble. But what shall I say then? 
shall I say, Father, save me from this hour when this is what I'm here for. This is my opportunity to show God, to, to, to demonstrate him, to demonstrate his nature, to demonstrate another version of love. You know, you see on these movies all the time where somebody gets in trouble and, and uh, they say, okay, you know, uh, <clears throat> what happens is the, the bad guys grab the, the, the banker and they, they, you know, come into his home at night and they say, okay, we're going to kill your wife and all your kids if you don't, you know, open the bank or something. Usually it's worse than that. It's like they're going to kill, they're going to blow up a whole city. And if you don't give us the key that will unlock the bomb or something, we're going to kill your wife and kids. But if you, if you give us the key to this bomb, we'll get you and your wife and your kids out of here, and you won't have to die. And nine times out of ten, folks, they, they, they give it up. They go, you know, I mean, you say, well, that's just the movies. No, that's human nature. <laughs> Don't give me that. That's just, you know, because we do stuff like that. We're, we seek to save ourselves. And it's about us and what we love. And I don't love you people, so all of you can die and go to hell. I don't care. I'm going to give you up so that my wife and my kids won't have to die. Mm. That just, that's just worrisome for me. I mean, I don't know what I would do in a real situation like that, but I think, of course, of course I would. Every man's way is right in his own eye. But I think that I would go, you know what? No, no. I mean, that's a, another old story. But when my kids were little, you know, of course, we were more charismatic then. But I told my kids, I said, look, they were, they were just little, you know. And they said, well, what, if, you know, what are they going to do, you know, when they come and take away our Bibles and they say, you know, they hold a gun, you know, and say, we'll kill you if you don't deny Jesus? And I said, you know. I said, if they come in and they hold a gun to your head and say, you have to deny Jesus, and they say, Randy, you deny Jesus or I'll kill your kids. I said, kids, I'm not going to deny Jesus. You'll be with him instantly. Yeah. Well, I haven't got to that part yet. You'll be with him instantly. And I said, if they hold the gun to my head and tell you to deny him, you say, no. You're just graduating him to be with the Lord. And don't, I'm telling you, let him do it. It's the best thing they could possibly do for me. I mean, you know. You know, I mean, there's, there has to be something in us that's different. And the love of God is different than human love. And it's supposed to function differently. And it's not supposed to be fo focused on what what I like and the way I like it done. You know, because we, we say, you know, we can we can deal with okay. You know, if it's going to be about what I like, you know, as far as what we're going to eat at this meal, I'll let you pick. But if it's going to be about the way, you know, I'm the leader, and the way we're going to do this is this way, and somebody comes along and changes it, well, you know, that's crossing all kind of lines here. Well, do you believe in the lamb? That's my question. Do you believe in the lamb? Do you believe that the, the greatest thing that will bring forth life is life comes out of death? If you believe that, if you really believe that, and you go, I'm not going to let somebody rob me or whatever or take over my leadership role. I'm going to be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Take it. You do whatever you want. You, you can't imagine how many times I've done that. Folks, I did that with all the property that we, we had when we were over on Maple. Turned it over to somebody who took control 
wanted to rule, wanted to take charge. I made him the pastor. I went off to language school. I did it before that, on that same property, when I was assistant pastor in another church. And basically everything was being taken away. And we had worked and built this daycare that was just a glorious daycare in this town. And I'm not just saying that. The woman who approved daycares wept when we left. I had this thing. And so here, all of a sudden, it's all, you know, Deb said, well, should we? I mean, we did buy most of the equipment and most of this and that and whatever because it was part of the church we were with at that time. And I said, no, no, give it all. Let's give it all. God will take care of us. If this is the right spirit, the same one who gave us that can give us even more. Well, guess what? Years later, that property that was rented by this other church where I was assistant pastor, we ended up buying it. And the day that it was paid for and done and everything else, we stepped onto the property. I remember putting my foot on the property and stopping. Deb was standing there and I looked over at that building that was the daycare center that we had given. And I said, cast your bread upon the water. And we went in there and all of the furniture and all of the stuff that we had put in there was still in there. <laughs> Not only that, but then we also got the two-story and the church and the house down the thing. So that it was, it was, you know. Well, I believe in this stuff. I don't fight for my rights. I, I know I need to grow more, but I'm just giving you examples because I think there are people that still, you know, they just go, well, you know, Randy's just, you know. He doesn't understand, so he says these things that we should do when it's going to not be good for us or something like that. Well, it won't be good for you if you're in the wrong spirit. It won't. Don't do it. Just walk off from Christ crucified and do what you have to do to maintain what is yours. Fight for your rights. Crucify those who go against you. Dis, you know, hate those who despitefully use you. <coughs> Spend your nights thinking about how you can get back at them. You know? Just, just work that plan. And you'll be so miserable, you'll end up a wreck. You will. But on the other hand, while there is a way that seemeth right, there is a way that is right, and it's the way of the Lamb. It is. You don't have to defend yourself or your stuff or whatever. You say, but can I? Sure, you probably will. If you ask that question, you probably will. <laughs> well, where's the problem here? The problem is I can't explain this to you. That's really where the problem is. You would jump on it if you could if you could see it as clearly as I do, and of course greater, obviously, we've already talked about that. I mean, it doesn't scare me. I actually look for opportunities to lay down my life. I actually do. I'm always looking for opportunities. We were in Belgium, and there was a little opportunity, just a little one, right after, the, I mean, we're just barely there. We come in, we're eating dinner, they're feeding us because we just got there and it's night and it's late and all these people start coming in and they come into the living room, they haven't had a chance to really even meet us and, and I'm sitting there going, Lord, give me an opportunity to do something out of your spirit and out of your nature, there needs to be a stake put in the ground. There needs to be a cross. I claim this land for Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? There needs to be a cross put into the ground and saying, this land now belongs to the Lord Jesus. And he gave me the most simple little thing and nobody there would see me. Actually, one person did and they didn't understand the spirit in which it was being done and said some 
something just crazy. But nobody, they were all in that room, and I got a chance to serve them all without one of them knowing it. Okay, well, in all of this, am I declaring myself, am I declaring what a great son of God I am or whatever? No. I mean, it may sound like it, and you may, you know, somebody eventually will see it as that. I'm just trying to communicate that I believe this. I'm not just a teacher. In fact, I don't want to be a teacher of it. I want to live it more than I want to teach it. I can't teach it. I clearly can't teach it. I know people that still struggle with this stuff because I can't teach it. So my only hope is that the Holy Spirit can really, really open the heavens and show this lamb on a throne. Wherefore, thou hast highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee, oh my God, if we could just see where that comes from. We could just see the cross in all of its glory as the Father sees it. In the glory of the Father. Jesus said when he's talking about the cross, now is the Son of Man glorified. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. That's what he's talking about. It's the death. It's the cross. He's going, now, now we're going to get some glory here. Now we're going to release some glory to the Father. The, you know, and you and I would have said when he got raised, now is the Son of Man glorified. It's about time and all of you people need to, we'll, we'll see, I, I don't think we'll see what I'm about to say <coughs> this, this go around. There's, it's just too much in that little section. But if we did get the time, we would see God's explanation of the throne of the throne and what he exalted and why he exalted that and what he expects from it. Praise God. All right. Um, I don't know. You, we, we can stop this stuff. Let me just check real quick. Uh, let's see if we're going to go for another round here. Um, did you say there are people here that have stuff that they could do?